Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Utopia session, what we believe is actually the star session of this edition of Horasis, an extraordinary edition in which we cannot shake hands. We can, you know, our lunch breaks are virtual. Everything is going on digital. So we are living the digital utopia in which we have been thrown by this uh, unexpected uh, crisis that pervades the world. And we are now, you know, grateful that we have such an environment which helps us with business continuity, which, you know, helps us to be here together today and continue our thought leadership, which helps us to receive healthcare remote if it's not needed to do that in person and many, many other things, education and so on and so forth. And who got the Secretary General of the UN into our homes today. So quite a treat and, and a lot of advantages. I'm Mihaela Uliero, president of the Impact Institute for the Digital Economy, and I have the honor to moderate a session with some amazing speakers, a lineup, which is incredible. And I'm sure at the end of this session, you are going to leave enriched with many new ideas for the present as well as for the future, as it pertains to digital utopia. In my work, I have been pondered about several scenarios of digital utopia, both as an academic and a research chair in e-society, as well as an advisor to business and government leaders. And uh, I have to say that, uh, unfortunately, the digital utopia is not only a positive thing, that there are a lot of things, the fake news, the cyber attacks, the, you know, not to mention the surveillance capitalists starting to become more and more pervasive. And as the UN Secretary General was saying that this crisis has revealed several fragilities, systemic fragilities of our world, so it has done for the digital environment. So I'm going to invite my amazing panelists now to introduce themselves in the context of their work as it relates to digital utopia. I'm going to start with Andrew Natchison, which is founder of We Media, of course, a very, very hot topic these days. Continuing with Astrid Haug, who is a digital advisor to high-level government and business personalities. Constance Buchheim, who is... Uh, managing director at, as, at iPotentials, which speaks for itself. Edwin Chan, who is an architect of the real life world. And we welcome him here in our session because we need to keep the connection to reality in our digital utopia, not to go too far uh, from what we can actually accomplish as humanity. And Krik Bresnikar, who is chief architect in the software world. So he is architecting the software of the digital utopia at HP Labs. Andrew, please. Thank you. Uh, well, first, uh, I want to say what a pleasure and a privilege it is to be asked to imagine a hopeful, better future. Uh, and, and I want to note that that's how I'm interpreting digital utopia. Um, we'll, we'll talk about all sorts of challenges to that. Um, but I'm taking our topic as a creative challenge uh, to allow myself to imagine what a digital utopia might be like. Um, and of course, that's that's a nice uh, break right now because the present is so difficult uh, and really tilting toward dystopia. Uh, and I would include the digital realm in that bleak assessment. I've been a digital utopian for most of my working life and maybe most of my life when I think about it. Uh, and I think about how much I've loved computers and, and I've thought of them as magical. Uh, so this should be an easy conversation for me, but it isn't. My sense of digital utopia, like everybody, it's informed by where we are, what's come before and what I've learned. And I was wrong about things in the past. So I have to start with questions first and doubts. Um, but like I said, when I hear digital utopia, I hear magic. A virtual world where things appear from nowhere, everything works and leads to beauty, harmony, personal well-being, security, and self-fulfillment. Wonderful. I will stop you here because I love it. <laughs> let's okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> so let's stay with the magic for now. Good. Astrid, please. <laughs> 
Yeah, so my name is Astrid Haug. I'm based in Copenhagen, where I'm an independent consultant uh, around social media and digital transformation. And uh, I think as Andrew, I also thought that we would end up somewhere different with all these technologies. Uh, so I am an optimist and a utopian, but I'm also becoming more and more pessimistic about the yeah the whole digital field. Uh, so I, I, I write a lot of books about this field, uh, mostly in Danish, and I'm also uh, on various boards, uh, UNICEF Denmark and, and some companies also as well. And it centers, it all centers around how can we work with, with digital uh, media and digital technologies to, to improve the world. And, and right now I see there's a lot of uh, tendencies that a lot of these technologies is not used for good. So I hope that's some of the topics we're going to be covering in this session. Thank you so much. Constance. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Constanza. I'm uh, based in Berlin and I'm the founder of Ipotentials, Ipotent uh, which is an executive search consultancy being focused on finding those leaders who are able to shape the future, no matter uh, if you're a, a new world company or an old economy uh, company. And um, that's the reason why I'm thinking about the digital utopia um, from a leadership perspective and from a relationship perspective. And um, I believe that we will um, end up in a situation where uh, technology helps to enable a situation um, of uh, leaders and uh, team members being on an, working on an eye-to-eye -eye level um, and where the situation we have always is one and one uh, uh, equals three, uh, which brings huge responsibility to everyone. Thank you so much. And, and before uh, I ask Edwin to introduce himself, I wanted to invite all my panelists to read the questions. I can see the comments are already coming in. So I just wanted to say, pick your favorite topic because there will be a time in our session where we can address those. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Edwin Chan. Uh, I'm an LA-based architect. Um, I was born in Hong Kong, but I study architecture at Harvard. And for 25 years, I was the design partner for an architect by the name of Frank Gehry. And together we did some of the most uh, celebrated cultural projects, such as the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao and the Foundation Louis Vuitton in Paris. Um, since 2013, I uh, started my own practice. Um, it's called EC3, but it is not really my initial. Um, it stands for, the E stands for empower, and the three C stands for connect, collaborate, and create. So the firm and my design approach is very much about this kind of cross-disciplinary collaborations. I like to work with uh, designers in all creative professions to create design solutions. Um, and I like to approach everything from a as a cultural project. So I think as we discuss the digital utopia in the next hour, I would like to think about it uh, from the point of view of arts and culture and how it could be an environment where arts and culture could flourish. Uh, but we'll talk about this some more in the, uh, in the coming hours. Wonderful. And thank you so much, Edwin. And I agree that we, one hour wouldn't be enough. We only have 45 minutes, unfortunately. Just wanted to remind everybody. And uh, there's so much to say. So please, Kirk, I don't want to take any. Kirk Presnicker, I'm the chief architect at Hewlett Packard Labs out here in the Silicon Valley. And uh, it used to be when you came and said, I'm from the Silicon Valley and I'm here to help, uh, people were a little uh, more uh, Open armed. Uh, now uh, we try and, and we're sort of veering back and forth between utopia, dystopia. I think it is useful to remember that when St. Uh, Thomas More coined the phrase, utopia doesn't mean good place. It means no place, uh, an anti place. Uh, and I think that's why, you know, digital is perhaps the best way to realize the saint's vision. And for me, it is replacing the tyranny. And that tyranny is the tyranny of the average, uh, the tyranny of convention, conventional approaches. Uh, I've been at Hewlett-Packard for uh, 30 years now, 
and I can remember when coming and, and using a computer meant coming up to a terminal and uh, it was 25 characters in 80 rows and uh, and it only displayed English characters uh, and now you just think of that incredible immersive environment we can have that now just destroying distance and so can we actually establish and, and really what I think of my job in Digital Utopia is to engineer those systems that have something that's different they are equitable they are sustainable and those two things go together if something's not sustainable it's inherently inequitable because we can't all afford to use it how can we have systems that maintain sovereignty uh, and use radical personalization not to market to us but to fulfill and to offer us that opportunity and food and water and education that befits our individual human dignity, our individual variations down to our DNA, respecting privacy and enabling unique uh, contributions from each and every one of us. Fantastic, fantastic. And of course, yes, I mean, you already are sliding into our next topics. But before this, I just wanted to go more uh, back to Andrew's magic and say that my dream for many years was when I wake up just to switch off, uh, switch on my holodeck and the holodeck is still yeah. workground and then be there with all my friends to co-create, inspire, unite, just like the logo of this Horasis. And, of course, uh, there is the dystopian nature as well, which unfortunately yes, has taken over quite a lot, uh, as Kirk uh, mentioned, and we will get there. But before this, I would like to ask each of you, and I will start with you, Kirk, and I, we will go in reverse order, uh, Kirk, Edwin, Constance, and so on and so forth. Um, I would like to ask you, if I were to, you know, to ask you about the digital utopia and your opinion, one year ago versus now, when we actually practically don't have much choice but to, to live digitally, would you have answered differently about your uh, I th I think I would have. I know my own life has changed dramatically. You know, last year I had circled the uh, world on an airplane about uh, 22 times. And uh, now I have uh, gone between my kitchen, my living room, and this uh, office uh, uh, more times than I can remember. So we've we've seen that transformation. We've we've understood that we can actually continue to live our lives in a very different way, in a much more connected way. Um, can you know conversations like this? We've seen. I know my own personal experience. International conferences. Uh, you know that I've seen the number of people attending skyrocket because now you don't have that physical component that comes with it. So that connectivity, that connection, that interconnection. Now we still need to work out. The way we have those individual conversations, I don't get to turn around in the lunch line and introduce myself the way that I could at a real conference. But, you know, the majority of the, the day that we spend is very different now. And so that ability. Now, I think if we can harness that energy and that transparency and rework education, rework healthcare delivery. I had my first uh, remote uh, medical session just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so understanding how we will use these to sustainably deliver to all eight and then 10 billion of us in a way that is sustainable again. I think that's really where we're getting a hint uh, from what we're having to improvise now and we'll see that improvisation become improved and optimized and then hopefully universally delivered. Thank you so much, thank you. Edwin. Yeah, so um, I'm talking from a, an architect's point of view in the physical realm. Uh, if you and architects have historically always been interested in kind of envisioning or imagining the future. So, from Leonardo da Vinci's ideal city to say maybe Frank Lloyd Wright's Bordica City. So those were kind of utopia in the physical realm in the in in the historical past. Now, before COVID, if you were to ask an architect what does a digital utopia mean today, I would suppose uh, um, a utopia with the latest digital software. So that means, and since we live in LA, uh, these digital utopia might mean some kind of Hollywood movie set, like uh, Blade Runner or Star Wars or Avatar. But inevitably, they're kind of using progress 
to speculate on what the utopia might look like in the future. Um, but with COVID, I think we've sort of discovered this digital utopia is not really uh, some futuristic uh, city, but it's more of an existential construct. So as long as you can access the network, you can lock on to this new digital utopia uh, from your office space or from any suburban homes. Uh, so it's not site specific anymore, uh, like what um, uh, uh, Kurt was saying. Uh, the distinction between this new digital utopia of today and the past is, I think it doesn't try to encompass and uh, to present an all-encompassing vision of the future, but it's very much fragmented and it's very personal experience uh, using the size and the scale of your devices, whether it's the phone or, uh, or your tablet or your internet. In other words, Thank you. All, okay. can we hear? <laughs> I think there's loss of signal or something. I don't know. Uh, no, we could hear you very well. I, I just thought you were done uh, and I was ready to ask Constance. Is okay. there anything? Yeah, so okay. we can continue. We, we will have more rounds. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, for me, as I, as I said, Digital Utopia is um, a state of mind and a, and a way of working and an, and an attitude. And uh, I wouldn't say... Uh, my digital utopia had changed uh, through uh, the lockdown. Um, I just, I just say we came closer to it, and um, more people joined our attitude and our idea. Not because they have the same beliefs, and not because they have the same values like we do, um, but because they saw the necessity. And I think that is something. That's very true for Germany. Um, we have a lot of the uh, very small and, and uh, medium-sized old businesses, and they all said, well, we don't do that. Um, and now they saw that being digital and working in a digital world, um, giving trust and responsibility to employees really helps in being future-proof. And now they understood, oh, my God, we have to do it. We have to deal with it. And, this really helped uh, large in the community. I, I love this. Yes, I love this too. Of course, we all love it. It's, <laughs> that's why we are here. Yes, we can continue uh, our work. And okay, so Astrid, please. Yeah, so uh, I think also we have seen uh, during uh, COVID-19 that a lot of things that couldn't be done beforehand, they got done in a matter of days and hours. So uh, a lot of companies and, and people have, have gotten a lot of like digital self-confidence and a lot of businesses have matured their digital readiness and, and how they sell online and how they approach their customers online and so on. But I'm also a bit biased because we have become even more dependent on these uh, tech companies during the COVID-19. So while at lockdown during the COVID-19, I couldn't stop thinking about what would happen if we had like a major cyber attack or, you know, something like that, because we, we, we also very fragile because we become so dependent on, on technology. And also there's a few of these uh, big uh, technology companies that that um, become an even larger part of our lives, of our work lives, of our schools. And that means they also get a, a bit more power. And I think one of the other speakers talked about uh, utopia and the internet being a, a place free of uh, tyranny. And I think that's a, that's a good picture of it. But we also have the tyranny of, of the big tech companies right now. So on the mm. one hand, I think there's a lot of opportunities and, uh, and there's a lot of creativity going on. And I just embrace it and I think it's really cool. But it also makes me a bit more worried because who are actually in control by the end of the day? Yes, and obviously these are issues which we confronted before uh, the crisis, but now they are even stronger because we rely on those platforms, all of those what I call predatorial platforms. But we'll get there in the next question. Andrew, please. Yeah, the, you know, the present moment or the, you know, the past year, nine months, um, it, I guess it has uh, forced me to assess where we are and 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 two things have emerged uh that are in conflict you know on the one hand there are aspects of our world that already are a digital utopia uh and and they are amazing 
Um, and uh, we've come so far that we've already, uh, many of us take them for granted. You know, our ability to communicate, to tap into the world's information, um, to conduct commerce, um, to, to uh, interact with and influence our experiences in the real world, like commerce that leads to physical deliveries and physical experiences. Um, the, these are all amazing things, and, you know, digital utopia, um, you know, might just be iterations on things we already have. Um, yes. Better technology, yes. Um, things, things that don't work as well right now uh, as we would like them to, and we can see pathways to improving those experiences. But on the other hand, um, we're not in a utopia. We can we can differentiate digital from real life, uh, you know, but the fact is our world is broken. Um, our, our society is broken. Uh, inequality is, is growing, is expanding. Uh, and so this, you know, what I called magic before, this digital magic, which has been transformational, um, but it has not yet uh, created a transformed world the way uh, I at least would think about utopia in real life. I would uh, say that, you know, actually the, you, the digital environment is deepening this. Uh, absolutely. Fissures, I would call it, if, in, the, in the broken society, indeed. I mean, lies propagate six times faster <laughs> on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook and so on and so forth. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, the recent, uh, the social, uh, you know, like dilemma movie. Uh, anyway, if not, I strongly recommend you. So as I envisioned it in my work, the digital environment was this magic that magic glue that unites, inspires us and enables us to co-create. However, we ended up with uh, predatorial businesses as we discussed and as such, um, you know, we have a software architect and we have a real life architect with us. And Mitch Kapoor pres pres presciently, <laughs> he, he said architecture is politics. And of course, then the reverse politics is architecture. So it matters a lot. And then from there, Harvard professor Lawrence Lessig uh, mirrored what uh, Kirk was saying or vice versa <laughs> that code is law. And actually how we write our software and how we deploy our software architectures is what is going to break it or make it in our digital environment. And as such, we ended up with all those predatorial platforms, capitalist surveillance, capitalism, and so on and so forth. So I'd like, uh, you know, to, to start with Edwin, uh, with his insights into can we actually do it better in the software world? What can we learn from the real life architectures uh, and from real life in general to do it better in the software world? Then mm -hmm. I will continue with Kirk. And of course, oh, the other panelists are very, very experienced with politics and with various facets of it. So we will go on with. Okay. Um, well, uh, as an architect in the real world, I, I've always been interested in how to design uh, an architecture for democracy. Um, and that's maybe one of the reasons why I chosen to live in LA is because I think LA may provide the closest uh, expression for uh, a democratic city, which is a collection of these uh, distinct neighborhoods and each one with its very unique uh, culture and characteristics. Uh, it doesn't present an image of, you know, unity, but in this sort of casual chaos, I call it, uh, it celebrates the value of diversity, which I think it's the DNA for democracy and democracy is kind of messy that way. So, and in my experience also as an architect, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, is that I know very well that uh, arts and cultural projects is the best way to build uh, strong communities. And strong community is the way to give respect and dignity uh, to its citizens. And, and like, for example, like, uh, the Guggenheim Museum that I designed in the city of Bilbao has gained incredible respect and dignity from the global uh, community. Now, since COVID, I think there's this, obviously, we all know that there's a surge 
uh, in online programming, in terms of arts and culture, amongst many other things, through digital exhibitions and discussions. And I think what this means is that um, arts and culture that used to be uh, inaccessible to many people, uh, many people couldn't afford to go to a museum or concert, have now all of a sudden become accessible in this new uh, reality. And many artists, visual artists, filmmakers, musicians, writers, etc., have used this time of COVID to actually produce work that are incredibly uh, relevant to our so current social uh, debates. Because artists have always been very keen observers and interpreters of our, our society. So the digital utopia, in my opinion, during the time of COVID has actually become an incredibly fertile platform for uh, creativity. And um, to quote the great uh, German artist, Gerhard Richter, he says that art is the highest form of hope. So being the naive and optimistic architect, I think that if we could engage artists uh, in designing the digital environment and making the arts flourish in, and more accessible to everyone, we can create a, a digital utopia that is more um, equitable respectful and dignified. So Thank that, you, Edwin. Uh, and Kirk, do you agree? Could you work with Edwin on that <laughs> as a software architect? <laughs> uh, I think the answer is, is yes. It, it's interesting when we think about computer architecture, uh, we see ourselves vacillating between two poles. We have centralized and we have distributed. We go back and forth. Uh, right now, you think, where is the where is my data? Well, it's in it's in the data center. Uh, that term itself is well, we had to center the data. Well, when I center data, I, I give up sovereignty over it. I give up control. And really, now I think what we're seeing is that as as that incredible tailwind we've had of Moore's law, semiconductor performance increasing exponentially. As that levels off, we're actually seeing a leveling of the playing field, and we're seeing more opportunity for more people to be admitted in. And really what we need to understand is how we move away from those centralized systems to distributed systems. Distributed systems are more complex. They're, they're messy, just like Edwin said, but that, in that messy dynamic chaos, when it's not just a, a hub and little spokes, but an interesting mesh topology, we actually have the opportunity to have things that are more sustainable, more secure, uh, more robust because there's not a single point of failure. Uh, and in in that sense, um, there could also be more sustainable because the energy is more distributed. We don't have to put it all in one place. And we add up those things, secure, robust, equitable, well, that actually makes it more just. Um, so I think as we look towards the future, and the future is that in as few as five years, only one byte out of four that an enterprise creates will probably ever see a data center, those old things. It'll be anachronistic when we talk of the data center because data permeates three-dimensional space and the relationships between it are not the fixed rows and columns of a spreadsheet. They're di the incredibly dynamic interactions that we have in our own personal and professional spheres, all interrupting, but one where we retain the sovereignty. And in retaining that sovereignty and working beyond trust to proof, mechanical proof that goes back down to the semiconductors, that we can actually establish a train of mathematical proofs between information and our consumption of it. So I think when we look at all wow. these things, it'll be, it'll be tough, it'll be complex, messy, but I think it really has the opportunity of being much more just. Uh, well, amazing, and I already see those three-dimensional or maybe multi-dimensional, uh, uh, you know, in which you are presenting to us. So, Constance, can you take one from there and, and let us know how does politics plays here and and uh, give us a perspective from uh, from. Well, I was uh, just thinking about the link between architecture and uh, entrepreneurs as um, a very important group for uh, development of uh, society and uh, uh, structure in, uh, in society. And what I really see um, and, and what I think is that we need to build really, really, really user-centric systems. And uh, building user-centric systems, this means we have to focus on client experiences, we have to focus on employee experiences, and really stop our ego 
and think about, okay, what is giving the value, you know? As entrepreneurs, we, um, we should be thinking about, okay, who am I building this for? And who am I building this with? And um, as, as customers, it's really like um, every time you spend your money, uh, you're, you're giving a vote about you want the world uh, to be, you know? So um, it really, yes, really, really... it's clear. Really, it's politics. You give your vote with your mind. Yeah, I got it. And this is what we, um, what we should be thinking uh, about. Yeah. Amazing. Astrid, please. Yeah, yeah. Some some really great points there, and I would love that world that uh, that Edwin talked about, where the internet is built on on uh, yeah poetry and culture and arts. Uh, I would definitely prefer to go there. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and just to to, uh, to take on some of the things that have been said, I think that new uh, world has to be uh, yeah user centric. It has to be based on uh, users reclaiming the data. So imagine you actually own your own data. Imagine that you actually knows where you your data ends up and, and who has it. Uh, today, you have no idea when you go online, where's my data actually ending up. So reclaim that data and also uh, make it portable. That has actually been a suggestion in the US Senate as well, that you should, as a user, be able to take all of your data and put it into uh, another system. So also making some standards between the, the various social media and, and online systems and also actually uh, making for example social media and other platforms um, obliged to to let users know how much money have have we earned on you today so taking that commercialization a bit out of the internet and trying to rebuild it and i think we in order to do that we need some new players uh, to be honest i don't necessarily trust that that it will be facebook amazon and google who will create this new world, but I definitely think we need it. So uh, I hope that all the other speakers are right in their, in their great visions. There are many startups, yes, I'm advising a few of them. And indeed, yes, I, I, I believe uh, the time Can will add, start. Can I just add the problem today is though that you have, you have these few players that are so big, so it's really, really hard for startups to enter that market. So that's why I believe strongly that we need more regulation in this field. And we have done it before. You have seen regulations, you know, in the banking and telecommunication and so on. So it's, it's, it's hard for a startup today to come in and compete with, with the big players. Sorry, we need both regulation as well as vote with your support, as Constance was saying. So both in order to turn this huge tide. And I think Andrew has a lot to add here. One thing which I'd like him to you know, address, if possible, is the truthfulness on social media and actually how can we, uh, can we keep it you know, more in tune with reality and with truth? Is there a possibility for that? Of course, social media is a reflection of reality in many ways, but I think it is somehow amplifying the negative aspect, the dystopia versus the magic. So how can we make it keep the magic? I know these are hard questions. Uh, well, I think you talked about truthfulness, um, uh, uh, which, which is um, you know a very difficult way of looking at it. Uh, and... My truthful answer is no. Uh, um, uh, dishonesty, disinformation uh, will endure, uh, and and I think it is um, uh, not just naive but futile to imagine that um, uh, manipulation is somehow going to uh, fade away or be mitigated uh, by technology. You know, one of the great things about the emergence of the web and the digital experience is the creative aspect of it, um, uh, you know, really as a canvas and a playground for technologists to use technology in ways that weren't imagined by the people who invented the technology. Uh, and uh, I don't see that going away. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, so the real question is, how do we manage? Uh, how, uh, how, how do we endure and manage and, and steer the system uh, in a way that gets us closer to where we want to be? 
Uh, and I think there are some aspects of technology that absolutely can help with that. Um, you know, trust and, um, you know, what I call kind of knowledge trust systems, no trust systems are, are really inherent, uh, in the web and digital experiences. Uh, and, uh, and the way we, uh, evaluate and place trust in sources and in information, uh, is really different in the digital realm, uh, than it is in, in the real world. And, and that's a, a positive thing that can be used in new ways, I think, um, to, um, to filter out disinformation, um, to flag it. Uh, think about how, um, successful Facebook is uh, at filtering out pornography. Um, uh, you know, it's really uh, given, um, given that pornographers are some of the most advanced technologists uh, and typically are, uh, you know, pioneering innovators uh, in content experiences, um, it's, it's really impressive uh, yes, Andrew. Not. So what, what I have to say here, of course, I wouldn't give them too much space on my panel, though. Yes. So what I have to say here <laughs> is, yes, there are technologies like formal verification and, and other mathematical uh, tricks, which Kirk referred to, which can now base, you know, deploy so-called trustless architectures in which this verification is embedded and they can filter out the negative aspect. So I will dare and then dare to contradict you a bit and really stay positive here that we yeah. can weed out those uh, nocive effects. But before um, giving each of you the last word, because we have unfortunately very few minutes left, um, I would like to um, ask you if you have any topics. Uh, so Astrid, you wanted to add something quickly or? Yes. Yeah, no, it's just that we have a really good question actually in the in the chat if I can answer that for Maria. Before this I would like to ask each of you, yeah, I was right there. Uh so each of you and you will take your turn to choose your favorite topic, exactly what Astrid was doing now, choosing her question. And if you can at the end of the un giving the answer also make your closing statement for the panel. So Astrid, now <laughs> you earned your first yeah, okay, no, that's great, thank you. So there's a great, great question from uh, Maria in the context of the pandemic, teens are looking to social media and are there any of these platforms that do not use persuasive technology algorithms? And I was just looking into the numbers uh, as well. You see uh, among uh, teens and young people, uh, you see them using social media as the primary source of political information. So for example, take the, the political uh, debate and presidential election and so on, uh, American teens uh, are mostly looking online for news. Um, and, and to answer Maria's question, I, I can only come up, uh, I can only think of uh, one or maybe two um, examples of that. And one is actually Wikipedia. And I see that as like one of the last uh, really um, pure places uh, on, on the internet because it doesn't have an algorithm. So you need to know what you're searching for. You can go to the, the front page and it will just, you know, uh, give you some, some various topics, but it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't follow you. More honest architecture been looking on yeah exactly and and also and the other one of course yeah. is is you know a traditional news so uh, teens have to learn to to seek traditional news sources it could also be like you know a bit more uh, new media like axios and politico and and so on it doesn't have to be in new york times or financial times and so on but just to say they actually need to uh, engage with real news because if you just follow uh, news on social media you get it either black or white uh, based on some of your uh, clicks and, and searches and so on and i think that's a bit scary so just to make my final remark a uh, final statement in terms of digital utopia i would wish uh, the internet to be a place where i would actually send my kids and feel pretty safe about uh, sending my kids so a bit like having them driving uh, on their bikes in traffic here in Copenhagen. I know it's a bit dangerous. We, we practice it and I talk with them about what not to do and what to do and some big roads they should avoid. But overall, I actually feel safe that they, uh, they, can, they can use this space, use this sphere uh, without me having to, to stop them all the time. So uh, I would like to see that uh, as part of my utopia and, and to bring them up in, a, in a, a safe environment, of course, with a lot of debate and so on, but also a place where 
uh, where you can actually have uh, great conversations with people and be creative, as some of the other speakers has, has talked about. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Constance, please, do you have a special topic? If not, the closing statement. I yeah, um, like the, the, the point I want to make is um, Digital Utopia is about uh, maturity from my point of view um, because it's a state of overcoming the ego to be able to act in the interest of others. And this is what I think is progress about, you know, and to be able to overcome the own ego, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty uh, sure that we have to learn to deal with our emotions. So what I really want to want to say is learn to deal with your emotions, show our kids how to deal with emotions and really start being really, really, really um, authentic and become really mature. And this is where I think the progress is. And um, it's not that we have to create technology. It's not that we have to create big systems. It's really about starting with myself to build a better world. Yes, and I think it's a natural transition to Edwin, who was talking about arts and so on. So Edwin, please, if you have a special topic or a closing statement, we have... Well, you know, the, the thing is, I had a different closing statement, but after I listened to Asterix, but also I was in a, listening to a different panel a little earlier today. And I think in that panel, it was a discussion about the future of uh, education and how kids now can only do online education. And I think this speaker said that, you know, her kid now said to her that, um, you know, she doesn't, uh, he doesn't really want to go online school. He'd rather design a digital environment. And, and I was very intrigued by that comment. And I think the kids kind of are, it's our future, so to speak. And I would be really delighted and excited to live in a digital utopia designed by the next generation. Uh, because I think that gives me hope. And I will leave with that thought. Thank you so much. So, Kirk, it's a natural transition to you here. So how do we actually design better digital environments that maybe can include your emotional maturity or help us achieve it? <laughs> I know it's a tall order. But, you know, maybe you want to also touch on governance of and in the digital environment. The floor. Thank you. Uh, so I think one of the most exciting things to me is that we are reaching a point where it will be economically admitted for more and more diverse people to innovate. You know, if, if you it has been that if you weren't there in 1970 when Gordon Moore first drew that curve and you weren't invested back then, you've been locked out. You've been only been able to consume the technology. But as we make this transition to these distributed systems, to systems that are native, that it doesn't matter if you read text right to left or left to right. Now you can have beautiful typography on your mobile device and on your screen. So we're admitting more and more people to be able to create. And I think that's also important because we also want more and more cultures to be digital natives. And and then we'll have a great market and, and competition and in that environment that, that you know we heard talked about that that is that that melange that is Los Angeles. What if, what if that is globally, where each community can interact, but they're also natively supported. And so I think both economically and innovation, as well as our user interface and, and the way we interact, we're seeing it happen. I think the other thing is that as we make these things sustainable, and they are, in fact, equitably distributable, that raises the possibility that more and more people will have the means to really make and affect positive change. Amazing. And I'm risking here. I've been risking by letting Andrew to have the last word. I that's still okay. hope he will leave us on a positive note. That's <laughs> yeah, right. I've, I've got the clock in front of me, too, <laughs> so I'm aware. So, so look, I, I, I'm going to echo, but uh, a caution as well. Uh, a digital utopia is an equalizer. Uh, it, uh, and let's just say it should be an equalizer. And um, if the digital future is not an equalizer, then it isn't a utopia. And totally I'll just agree. That. Totally agreed. So governance, poetry, <laughs> emotional intelligence. 
we have it all. Thank you so much for your participation. Time is up, but uh, we are still being recorded here. So I really, really am very grateful for what you shared. I'm sure our audience as well. And uh, you can maybe use the platform to answer digitally in the meantime, or even when we stop the streaming. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.